Greetings and welcome back to our Universal Canon of Literature series. I've got a real treat for us tonight. Basically, within the Universal Canon of Literature series, I'm going to, for the next few videos, going to concentrate on a, a subtitle, if you will, which I have called the transformational role of literature in human history focusing on those works of literary art, because yes, they are of art, which speaking through the vehicles of allegory and symbolism, basically searching through the animus mundi, as uh, Yeats called it, or the soul of the world, as the Latin translation word for word goes, Basically, it is, according to the Swiss psychiatrist and great anthropologist Carl Gustav Jung, it is a repository of all those symbols common, not only to every culture in the world, but to every living, breathing human being. The animus mundi, the racial unconscious, you could also call it the symbolic unconscious. You could call it the universal well of symbols and archetypes, which following certain cultural and anthropological patterns have given us such wonderful works of art in our time as Star Wars, Star Trek, basically films which are so surcharged with power because they are replete with symbols that go back to the New Stone Age, even, even before. We call them archetypes. And these archetypes, which are like psycho, religio, cultural patterns that concretize in certain noticeable forms, especially in the form of storytelling. For instance, an archetype would be the old man, usually the old man endued or endowed with a lot of power, like a magician, a hermit, or the witch, uh, a young prince, a young princess, um, sidekicks of the nature of uh, C-3PO or R2-D2, or in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Sumeria and Acadia, and later Babylonia, um, in its final redacted forms, that is, the Epic of Gilgamesh's very own sidekick, Enkidu, who was Gilgamesh's constant bosom buddy. These are archetypes. The Sword of Excalibur, the lightsaber, the phaser on Star Trek, any instrument that bears energy, that transmits a source of power, are archetypal. Now, let's gallivant ahead out of the realm of science fiction and fantasy into a 19th century work of attempted historical fiction by Pierre Louis. His last name is spelled L-O-U-Y-S which means that he pretty much came from the Low Countries, near Brussels. It can be pronounced Laos, or Louis, or Louis. Um, but Pierre Louis, in 1896, wrote a wonderful book called Aphrodite. And what he did in this novel, which we're about to explicate, is he drew upon a very old archetype, that of a young woman who, from whom cascades love, if you will, whether the goddess of love or a beautiful young ingenue endued with, with, this, with, the, with a beautiful uh, way about her that lures men. And of course, later, we're all familiar with the idea of the femme fatale, 
on which Hollywood capitalized in the 1940s. The femme fatale is the woman of beauty who lures men to their destruction. Like the siren of the Homeric Odyssey. But back to the novel Aphrodite by Pierre Louise. It's set in the year 58 BCE. Queen Berenike of Egypt. Now it's pronounced Berenike. Um, it looks like Berenice in English or French. And it may be pronounced as that. But the Greeks pronounce it Berenike. Now, Berenike was the name of several very important queens during the Ptolemaic period of Egypt, which was its last ruling dynasty. A dynasty, or dynasty as the British pronounce it, which was not ruled by native Egyptians, but rather by all, all of whom were descended from one of Alexander the Great's victorious generals to whom Alexander entrusted the satrapy of Egypt. His name was Ptolemaios, or we call it Ptolemy in English, we shorten it. The Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt were all Greeks, everyone. And one of the greatest ironies, if not slap in the face of history, is that it took the last ruler like 30 rulers later, Cleopatra VII. We know her as Cleopatra, but she was actually the seventh woman who bore the name Cleopatra. And in the royal uh, genealogies, she is listed as Cleopatra VII. It was only Cleopatra VII who, ironically, was also the last ruler of Ptolemaic Egypt, the last in the line of the Ptolemies, who was the first to actually sit down and learn and to speak fluently the language of the natives, which was Egyptian. She was not Egyptian by blood. She was Greek. However, she was fluent in Greek and Egyptian and Latin and possibly Hebrew and what we would call ancient Arabic in addition to which she was a paramour of Julius Caesar and uh, Mark Antony. She is the last ruling Greek princess in the Ptolemaic dynasty, and she was also the first of the Ptolemaic dynasty who, in her case, became the high priestess of the goddess Isis. Now, Aphrodite or Aphrodite in the Greek pantheon corresponds to the Egyptian Isis or Isis, which is from the Egyptian Iset, which means she of thrones. Aphrodite is a Greek word which basically means, well, it, it points to her supposed origins, the, 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 the origins of this goddess who was, according to one legend, was literally born from the foam of the sea. But getting back to this, um, Queen Berenike of Egypt falls passionately in love with a handsome Greek sculptor, Demetrius of Alexandria. But the love, honors, and power she offers him are useless. Why? He has fallen in love with the statue of Aphrodite. Berenike pleads for his love. He rejects her. Then one night on the streets of Alexandria, Demetrius meets a beautiful courtesan, Chrysis of Galilee, and falls in love with her. She remains elusive, and to torment him and turn him completely to her, she asks him to fulfill three of her wishes. He must steal the mirror of Rhodipus from her friend Bacchus, whom she hates, kill the beautiful widow Tunis at her wedding to the new high priest, and take from her the comb of Queen Nitocris, or Nitocris, Long story short, you'll learn more about this legendary Queen Natokris from Book Two of Herodotus's History. Natokris was uh, a legendary queen, probably ruled before the Old Kingdom period of Egypt. What Herodotus reveals about her is amazing. 
I'm not going to go into any details because we don't have time. I'll touch on it in, in a different video. But the vengeance of Natokris is legendary, to say the least. Now, also must steal the necklace of seven strings of sacred pearls from Aphrodite's lifted hands in the Temple of Love. He fulfills all her wishes, but afterwards he is filled with remorse. When Croesus offers herself to him, he will not have her. Later, the city is alarmed. The comb, mirror, and necklace must be restored, or great disaster will descend upon the country. Naked and carrying all three stolen treasures, Croesus ascends to the top of the great beacon of Alexandria. The people take her for the goddess Aphrodite. When she's brought down, the sculptor murmurs, My Aphrodite! Blind I was, I did not know that you, Croesus, were the reincarnation and life of all that I had worshipped in the ideal. But it's too late. Croesus has taken poison and dies. Now, this work has long been considered one of the minor classics of um, exotic literature, the genre. And one last thing I want to say is, is that this is a later Hellenistic Greek retouch on the idea of the, in the classical period of Pygmalion, you know, the sculptor who spurns all women but falls in love with the image uh, that he sculpts uh, of, of the ideal woman. And this is, of course, later touched on by uh, George Bernard Shaw in his riveting play, um, My Fair Lady. So um, that concludes this video. But please bear in mind that not only are we still within the universal canon of literature, now we're looking at those works which are so archetypically, archetypally surcharged that they take on almost a transformational role in the lives of the culture that have produced them, and indeed, even in our own lives. Nobody can deny the absolute literary potency of a work of art such as the Bible, whether it be the, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, and Hebrew Bible, or the, Jew, uh, the Christian uh, Bible, the so-called Old and New Testament, or the Muslim, uh, the Islamic uh, Quran, uh, the, the sacred volumes of all the, the world's cultures seem to be surcharged with these archetypes. And writers such as Pierre Louis, having no religious acts to grind, rather just wanting to tell a story, draw from the same powerful wellspring of archetypes. All right, until we meet again, thank you.